Hello, everybody. My name is Catherine Barron. I'm a longtime education reporter and host of The Score, a podcast about academic integrity and cheating. Over six episodes of The Score, we'll be looking at the landscape of cheating in school and delving into the key issues at play in this multifaceted issue challenging academia today. We'll ask the experts and students to provide insights into what's happening in our classrooms. How big a problem is it? Who cheats? Along with what policies, regulations, and changes in teaching and assessments show promise in curbing cheating. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at PodcastTheScore, one word, or stop by our website to download show notes and see our lineup of guests and release dates. We're at PodcastTheScore.com. Again, that's PodcastTheScore.com. On this episode of The Score, we're speaking with Alexander Matros, a professor in the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina, and Aaron Bielan, assistant professor of data analytics at Dickinson College. Both are chess players, and in their September 2020 study, Online Cheating Amid COVID-19, they examined the connection between cheating and online chess and the extent of online cheating in universities. The report describes how the International Chess Federation and the Internet Chess Club deal with cheating and suggests what universities can learn from that. Welcome to The Score. Nice to see you. Yes, great to be on. Why did you select online chess as a barometer for online cheating in colleges and universities? Yeah, so if you look back, chess had this problem for uh, over of like 20 years. And uh, chess was played online on different uh, platforms, including this Internet Chess Club. And it was interesting to see how they deal with a uh, problem of cheating. And we tried to use this experience for what we can see now in education. Now, what are the differences, though? Because clearly a private chess club can do different things than a college or university. Yes. So if you look at a private chess club, uh, they have this problem that if somebody is trying to cheat, then um, if this uh, information is uh, public knowledge, then nobody wants to join the club because it's very difficult to compete with this guy who who might win everything. And cheating might take like different forms. For example, uh, somebody might help you, then you can use uh, uh, computer support. So this like there are many different ways. What we saw last year, for example, during pandemic, um, this was like very, very similar a situation because uh, if you think about cheating on exams, for example, at colleges, universities, schools, uh, you can also get outside help from somebody in your room. You can also try to use your computer and search for answers. So from this point of view, so these like very, very similar problems. And uh, the difference is, is only that in chess, we saw that more than 20 years ago. And we can try to look at their previous experience and in academia. So we just saw that last year. Why has it been going on for in chess for so long? That just kind of surprised me. It's just, again, this is a kind of nature of the beast. So in humans, they, they would like to win. So they would like to get some money. And um, in chess, if you are not the top player, so you would like to prove that you can beat everybody else. And if you see that you have some problems, one possibility is to use some outside help. It was a lot of money on stake. So for example, if you qualify for um, this event, so then even if you eliminate it immediately in the first round, you can win like $5,000. And now we're talking about like more than 20 years ago. So it was a lot of cheating. So just like uh, people try to help, people try to use computers and so on. So this was just... Uh, one kind of extreme but if you look at research side so you can see that in different competitions so people try to show that they're the best so sometimes money involved but even if you remove money so it's still like uh, uh, on pride so you can try to show that i'm better than like my uh, my opponent and people did some experimental studies when uh, they found that uh, in a tournament without prizes people would still ready to put some effort in order to win the competition so it's not just that the stakes are high, there's money involved or winning a competition, but there's also something about human nature that's involved. Yes, yes, yes. So, so even if price is equal to zero, uh, so then people are ready to put uh, uh, effort when you have to spend resources. And then at the end, um, you win nothing, but uh, you win like your pride. So, okay, so I managed to beat these guys, yeah. In academia, you specifically looked at advanced placement exams, which can earn high school students college credit. And what did you find there? 
And what was different? Was it online for the first time? Were there hybrids? What changed during COVID? Yeah, the 2020, the, the 2020 AP exams were the first time um, that these AP exams were given um, online uh, because of, this was basically because of COVID. And so what happened was this. So if you look at Google searches, and this is public information, you can just access this information uh, you know, easily. What you see is this. So the 2020 AP exam for the math subject was given on May 12. So this was in the afternoon, Eastern time. So we had 2 p.m. on May 12. And so if you look at some of the keywords related to math concepts, such as, you know, derivative, integral, critical point, inflection point, things like that, you'll see a spike at exactly 2 p.m. and then, you know, following 3 p.m. and so, and so on, it, it spike basically disappears. And so the next day, on May 13, it was the English literature subject. And so you, if, you, if you do a similar study, so you check this time, so instead of checking math-related keywords, you check uh, literature-related keywords. So you can do you know, imagery, literary techniques, diction, things like that. You get the spike exactly at 2 p.m. on May 13. This is, again, the time of the test. And then lastly, you can even check physics, for example. This was the next day on May 14. But this time, not 2 p.m., it was 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and you get this spike on physics-related keywords at exactly 4 p.m. on May 14. So it looks like students basically, you know, uh, did, you know, do some Google searching in order to, you know, find the answer. So was this helpful? Uh, yes, no, we're not sure, but at least students tried. <laughs> at least they tried to cheat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, was this an unproctored? online exam? That is correct. It was on proctored. Is the College Board changing the way it does that this year? Will there be proctoring? Yes, in 2021, uh, the College Board uh, decided to give options to students. So they can either take it at home, similar to 2020, but if they did, um, they had to use a camera. So there was some proctoring involved, unlike the 2020 version, or they could just you know, take the, take, take, take the exam at their schools. That was also an option 2021, which was not available in 2020. Of course, cameras don't necessarily uh, eliminate the cheating. A college journalism professor sent me an article about cheating written by a student of hers, and it begins with a description of how one student set up her desk before an online exam. And here's how it starts, and the name is, is, has been changed. It took junior Madison Davis an hour to set up for her economics final. Her phone, which she propped up against her laptop screen, displayed a quarter's worth of downloaded PowerPoint slides. Her notes were taped to the wall behind her computer. Minutes into the exam, a classmate's text popped up on her phone. What did you get for number two? Her movement was being monitored through her laptop's camera, and she didn't want to get flagged for suspicious behavior on what was supposed to be a closed note test. She typed her response quickly with one hand, careful not to move her phone out of its resting position. So they have this figured out pretty well. The students are very creative, so they are very, very smart, yeah. And this student also said that before the pandemic, she had never cheated on a test. She hadn't even considered it. But since classes were moved online in March, this elaborate setup has turned into her pre-exam ritual. And she said, the more people I talk to, the more I realize that everyone was cheating in some form or another. And you had posed several questions in your report, including whether colleges or universities can expect a surge in cheating to continue. And you write that unlike the face-to-face -face examination, cheating should be expected in online testing. And you add that cheating is a part of the student equilibrium strategy in the online examination. So what does this say about us? It just seems to be a sad commentary on, on who we are and our ethics. In our uh, paper, uh, we looked at uh, this problem from um, like at least two directions. So first was theoretical approach. And second, uh, we looked at some um, data from uh, real life exams. So we had um, a simple model. 
in this simple model, uh, like we just assume that uh, a student can uh, either cheat or not to cheat. So if nobody cheats, then uh, professors would never monitor, and then uh, it would be like so so simple to to cheat. And then uh, we also looked at uh, uh, data. And uh, so, Aaron, maybe you can just mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the data, what we found. Sure, yeah. So in the data, so we were quote-unquote lucky in the sense that we had one special tool that enabled us to basically pinpoint uh, what's going on, what's going on. The issue was this. So we looked at um, the time the students took to answer their questions. So we gave them basically a test with 20 questions. And these questions were not multiple choice. So the students had to basically enter numbers using their keyboards. And uh, what we saw was that some of the students um, had very strange timings. So for example, on a question that you will expect a student to take on average, let's say five minutes, the student gave an answer in seven seconds. And so this so okay, you can say, okay, this is one occasion the student just gave a random, you know, in, just used it, just inputted a random number or something. That was not the case. That was the correct answer. So for example, the correct answer was to say 347. So a student was able to pick that number, 347 in less than you know 10 seconds. And this kept going and going. So next question, similar. Uh, third question, again, something similar. So it kept on going for 20 questions. So the overall time the student took to complete the exam was about 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, for example, this student was, uh, was done with the test with a almost perfect score. So the thing was, you may not always be uh, lucky. So for example, if you were giving a, if you were giving a multiple choice test, then it's, it's very difficult because, you know, there's always a chance that uh, a student will randomly select answers you know, A through D or something, and then, you know, they, they score a perfect score. That's always a possibility. So it's very difficult for the, for the instructor to basically have, you know, have any claim or, or provide any evidence that there was cheating involved. But Aaron, in, in seven seconds, how did they cheat? Could they actually look something up online that quickly? So you cannot do this in seven seconds. So what we believe that students had was, that they had the answers from other students who volunteered to take the test before they did, and they gave them the correct answers. And then you basically had a list in front of you with you know, question names and then um, the correct answers. They basically looked at this test, uh, the, the answer sheet, and it probably took them on average you know, 10 seconds to be able to figure out that was the question that they're seeing on the screen. And basically they inputted the correct number uh, using their keyboard. So it looks like this on average takes 10 seconds. But even if it's an online proctored exam and it's using a company that has its own proctors, it seems a student could conceivably have someone else take the exam for them because that proctor wouldn't know who they are. That is absolutely right. So if there's no cameras, we basically have nothing such that, you know, we basically don't know if, if, if that's the student that, that who's taking the test or somebody else overseas or something that, 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 that basically is taking the test. We have, we have nothing, no information whatsoever. We don't have any, um, anything, um, you know, with respect to cameras or any source of identification method. Is there any indication that that's happening? Maybe on a large scale? What do you think, Dr. Metros? So, so I think on a uh, large scale, it's difficult to say. I think maybe even Derek uh, had some uh, some examples of that. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we were aware of a couple of cases when um, some people uh, over in China, so they tried to answer, um, like try to take tests for um, different students in different countries. So, so the, this is just. Um, it, it was definitely recorded, um, but uh, um, like one possibility uh, how to deal with this. So now um, there's like software which can uh, do this like face recognition. And for every student, you have uh, um, a picture of the student. And uh, for example, if uh, uh, an instructor um, does this like monitoring, at least just like look at uh, his or her class uh, once. So then it's of course like much, much easier because again, um, you know, the roster for your class 
and uh, um, you can just look at your students. Uh, it takes uh, maybe like a couple of minutes, and then you know, okay, so at least like I, I can make sure that I have my own students. And um, uh, even simple steps like, uh, okay, so I look at my students and then they know that you kind of like watch them. So this might be um, uh, very helpful because this might eliminate uh, many simple things. Like, for example, if uh, you can see somebody in the room, at least uh, you can see that maybe uh, there are no people like around this person who can just like try to help this person. Or at least you can uh, make sure that at least this is like the student who is supposed to be there and not somebody else. So um, these these are like simple uh, things which can help to um, eliminate like again like simple cheating. Yeah, it would not eliminate everything, of course, but but at least this would just like help uh, uh, like at first. You earlier had mentioned fairness, and it, it does seem that this issue raises some huge ethical issues around fairness because a student who works very hard to get good grades could very likely do worse in a class because that student didn't cheat, and even though teachers and professors know from, say, homework assignments and classroom participation, which students are studying, um, what can they do when the test results don't reflect that because of cheating? Yeah, I think in a sense you you ask very very important questions. So in a sense, during this like uh, pandemia, during like the whole year, so we had some expectations. We had some um, you can call this like social norms. So like what we expect. So let's say people would come to to a class and they would take a test and then uh, you can rank them based on these results and uh, everything is from this point of view like more or less fair. Um, now if you take a test at home especially if it's not proctored so nobody knows who took this test uh, and then the situation now is such that uh, we have like another social norm when um, it's kind of uh, if you have these expectations if you have these beliefs that everybody else is cheating so this immediately puts you in a situation when just you might be the best student but you feel that you have no chances to compete with these uh, other students unless you cheat as well and uh, we just move from what is called maybe like good equilibrium to a bad equilibrium when you have these expectations these are self-fulfilling expectations and uh, now if everybody cheats everybody expects that and uh, um, and then um, they play according to these like new rules and uh, this this is the same let's say um, if we put some analogy with chess for example so let's say before uh, uh, let's say if we go back for uh, 20 30 years so everybody plays uh, themselves so let's say if you're better so you're supposed to play better but uh, um, if uh, you can cheat with a computer so you can use this like computer help and now if you realize that maybe you're the best player but you have no chance against computer and to, to put everybody on the same level, you can say, okay, so now I'm not going to uh, monitor anybody. So it's not going to be uh, any chance to check whether people use some help or not. But I allow to use computers for everyone. And in this way, the hope is that, uh, so hopefully like best uh, or better players, they can use computer more efficiently. So the same is happening right now. So if you expect that everybody is cheating, so you can hope that, but the students, they can use this help more efficient and then they're still going to be on the top. So I think this is what's happening right now. What do you think about all the businesses that schools can contract with to provide online proctoring? Is that the way to go at this point? So I think um, like good news is that now more and more universities and colleges, so they start to move from online teaching to offline teaching. So they start to come back to uh, in-person teaching. And we are moving to this uh, better equilibrium when, uh, for example, you have all these tests uh, in the classroom and it's much easier to proctor and students expect, okay, so now we kind of like come back to the same situation which we faced maybe like a couple of years ago and they know, okay, so now I'm supposed to study, I'm supposed to do better. So this is like good news. Um, if we continue to do this online uh, testing, any kind of uh, monitoring will help. So for example, um, like we mentioned already, so if if a professor can look at uh, students, so this would immediately eliminate this kind of like clearly outsider. So for example, if you look at list of your students and you see some unfamiliar face, you might be surprised, you might just check this person and then you can see, oh, the name does not um, fit with uh, the face and then this would be kind of like red flag. So you eliminate these possibilities for kind of simple cheating. Second, for many students, so, so cheating might be like very, very simple. So maybe they just bring a friend or maybe they just like try to 
look uh, on something online. So they don't want to put like much effort and uh, they just feel, okay, so I'm kind of like uh, ready for exam and if something, so I can use all this. So if, um, if you put a little bit of um, effort trying to check them, so maybe they would just abstain from uh, this kind of behavior. And then um, this like even simple monitoring can remove a lot, a lot of uh, cheating. So it's, it would definitely not uh, remove all cheating, but it would remove simple ones. So for students like you described, so who would actually prepare their rooms, you cannot eliminate that, but, but they put so much effort. So if they would study instead, they would do so much better. It does seem like that, doesn't it? If you put the effort into studying that you do into figuring out how to cheat. <laughs> You'd get it. You'd do well. Um, but I'm wondering when you talk about face to face teaching, basically, a, a students in a classroom taking a test and a professor is there or a teacher. Let's say it's a lecture class and there are 400 students in the lecture hall taking that exam. A professor can't monitor all those students. What's one way to deal with that? You could, you could get some help from your, uh, from your TAs or your assistance. So you'll, like you say, you're absolutely right. So you cannot have one person proctoring 400 people. Um, you'll need at least three or four people. So in such large lecture halls, you'll typically get help from, uh, from teaching assistants with, with proctoring, which is still absolutely better than, you know, online exams with no proctoring. And, and Catherine, you have like one more thing, which is like very, very important. So this is like uh, the big difference between online and offline tests. So if somebody cheats offline and you might just believe that this, this is just like this was the case, it's, it's, it's always very difficult to find any proof. So, because you don't have like clear evidence, so you just, you have only some feelings, you have some observations, but, but it's never, uh, okay, so I just, I saw that you use some help in the classroom. Usually if uh, somebody is caught cheating, you have evidence, like very clear evidence. And then this means that um, for many students, so this might stop them because, I mean, of course, uh, it's still going to be some uh, cheating, even if you monitor students in the classroom and so on. But but they know that, okay, so if something is going to um, come up, then um, it will be like very clear evidence. And then once we go for this academic integrity committee, so then uh, everything is right there. So you don't need to guess because you have like uh, clear evidence. But online, so this is all only, so you just, you have some um, clues, you have some, um, like it, it's never direct evidence. It's only like indirect evidence. So you can say, okay, so, uh, the student took a test and finished this test in like five minutes, all 20 questions. It was multiple choice and the answer is perfect. But then um, is it possible? Yes, it's possible because again, like you can also win a lottery. So you just put a number and then uh, you just like and you won. So a student had a good day, so uh, answer everything correctly. So and then it's possible. So you just, you cannot say this was like uh, impossible. So student guessed correctly, so perfect. Uh, but but uh, in the classroom, so it's different because if you see that something happens, so then this is just like very different story. Well, that leads me to ask about how likely colleges and universities are to take punitive actions because you can't always tell. And, and in the chess organizations, you write that they simply disqualify people, they bar them from future participation. It doesn't seem like that's happening in universities. Maybe a professor might fail a student, but we don't see students being expelled or suspended in huge numbers for cheating. Here, I have only um, like one suggestion, and also we have this uh, in the paper at the very, very end. So it would be so much more consistent if a university has a particular rule for all departments, for all instructors, because unfortunately what we saw, let's say last year, um, uh, different instructors, they might have different rules. And uh, if university would uh, clearly say, okay, so our policy works like this. So the case goes to this academic integrity committee, then they make final decision and this is end of the story and everybody knows that. But um, what students experience in the past, so um, they take one class, they have like one set of rules. They take another class, they have another set of rules. And this was not like consistent, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But do your colleagues, feel that there is a lot of cheating going on in their classes or or do they feel that their students I, i'm just wondering like is, is there a consensus that yeah it's going on or are they sort of in the dark about it 
No, no, I think I think this is like clearly a consensus that was cheating, and what people would do, so they would try to find like some ways how to deal with with that. But but again, this is where it would be very helpful if uh, such initiative would come from the very top, such that we we'll say, okay, so this is going to be the same rule for all professors. And since we talked about proctoring, we talked about cameras, so it would be so much easier if, for example, let's say uh, it comes from the top of the university and they say, okay, so every exam must be monitored or let's say uh, every student must have a camera if it's an online test. It's kind of like the rule. Have either of you had students cheat? And if so, what did you do about it? Yeah, so so students, that they, they knew that they have case like that. So we we have to report the case to this academic integrity committee. And then after that, so um, the committee would decide with the student and it would just go um, uh, just between these two. So, uh, so this again, like this is policy from the university. This is your university, the University of South Carolina. Yeah, University of South Carolina. So just again, like if you see case of cheating, so you have to report to academic integrity committee. And then after that, so Academic Integrity Committee would deal with the student and then they would make the decision, yeah. And have you reported students? In my first 10 years, I, I, had, uh, I had zero cases. And uh, uh, like, yeah, and during pandemic, so yeah, I, I did report several cases. And then uh, it was really decision between um, Academic Integrity Committee and uh, students. So th this was just like, uh, it was kind of like off my hands after that, and then uh, they would make decisions. And decision of this Academic Integrity Committee is final. So they, they just make a choice and that's all. What are some of the things that happened to the students that you reported? Usually um, they would meet with the students, so they would look at the situation. And if uh, the decision from the committee that it was cheating, so then they put some notes on the record and uh, a student uh, would need to take some class uh, about like uh, the appropriate behavior and um, i think they would give like a warning so i don't know what would happen after like a second warning or if it's going to be second warning but but they definitely put some red flags around a particular student who would find be found like guilty of cheating yeah how about you aaron yeah um so i'm lucky in the sense that you know all our classes are in person um, you know, starting from this semester. So, so far, so good. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with um, what's going on. So uh, previous to though, so, you know, when we were giving exams online, um, yeah, it was, it was a little bit more difficult to, you know, ensure that there was no cheating because you can always, there's always some chance that some students were cheating even with cameras, because like you mentioned, so students can be creative and sort of come up with those, you know, creative uh, solutions. But, you know, if you're there in person, then, you know, I feel much better. Are universities hesitant, though, to take very strong action against students who cheat because they're paying so much money to go to school and you don't want, I mean, that could be part of it. The other part of it is, is that maybe the university doesn't want a reputation as having a lot of people who cheat, so they kind of quash it a bit. Have you found that? I'm just wondering how universities are reacting to this. Are they willing to take the strongest action against students, or are they concerned that because it's expensive to go to schools, they, they don't want to anger parents who are paying this money? or they don't want to be known as a university that has a lot of cheating. Yes, so, so um, we have uh, um, all sorts of evidence here. So we, we have some evidence when uh, universities would report a lot of cases. And here, um, let me again mention Derek. And so that's Derek Newton. He writes the cheat sheet. Yes, 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 exactly. Yes, yes. So, and uh, in his uh, uh, like uh, column, you can find a lot of examples when um, a lot of cases uh, were reported about cheating at uh, different universities. And uh, I think if university wants to report a particular problem or expel uh, like, like to extreme to some student, so they would really need to have some clear evidence of cheating. And this is where we have like uh, the main problem. So because if this would be an online test, then you have only indirect evidence uh, of cheating. 
But if instead the test would be done in the classroom and then you can have evidence, so then you can clearly say, okay, so this was cheating and, and then you have like all this like evidence. Have you found anything hopeful in the data or in human nature that, you know, just leads you to feel that things might start changing for the better? Yeah, I think things are getting better. Absolutely. So compared to 2020, I think we're in much better shape considering uh, that, you know, in many places the exams are given with in-person proctoring. Now, as in 2020, it was, you know, there was some chaos, basically, that, you know, all the tests had to go online all of a sudden, and then, you know, we basically didn't know what to do. So are we going to get, you know, a company such as ProctorU? Are we going to proctor students uh, ourselves on Zoom? Uh, what if a student, you know, complains and, you know, doesn't want to uh, use a camera on a Zoom call? So what are we going to do? So there, there was basically a, a good amount of chaos in 2020, but I think things are more stable now. But Aaron, when you say more stable, are you saying it's more stable because we are getting better at monitoring students? Or is it that maybe now that COVID is over, will students reduce the amount of cheating that they do because maybe they're having a change of heart? Yeah. I think I think students are students. As, that's probably us, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, showing any changes. So we have better tools basically to monitor them. So whether it be in person or with you know a using a company such as Proctor U or you know using Zoom proctoring or any other method. So as long as there's some proctoring method, I think we will be in, in better shape versus again in 2020, in most cases we had nothing. So let's wrap up with a question that's in some ways a summary, but maybe some very more specific recommendations that you have for teachers, professors, and colleges, maybe each of you give me two. Like, here are the top two things that we need to do. If you look at uh, our paper, and uh, we we, uh, we mentioned at the very end that it would be very nice if uh, uh, a university or college can have unified policy. So such that, let's say, uh, they can say, okay, so no proctoring for everyone, or maybe everybody must be on Zoom if we do the test, or maybe proctor you. So this is like very important because then uh, it's going to be consistent expectations for all students. So this is like uh, one thing. And second, so we're not going to eliminate all cheating altogether, but it's going to be much, much less cheating because now once everything is open, so students would expect that, okay, so now I come to the classroom. I'm not supposed to cheat. And then these uh, social norms will change. And then uh, we're going to see much, much less cheating in this way. Aaron? Yeah, we have to move from a bad equilibrium to, to a better one. Absolutely. I, I absolutely agree. You know, in order to do that, we need to use some sort of proctoring. So it could be in-person proctoring. It could be live proctoring. Uh, but, you know, with the use of proctoring, we can basically move from those bad equilibria to, to better ones. Because in a bad equilibrium, basically, you give an option to student to cheat. But if you're using proctoring, then, you know, hopefully 99% of the time, student won't be able to cheat. So that's sort of the, the, key, the key takeaway that I want to point out. So neither of you mentioned, hey, let's talk to the students about <laughs> ethics and honor. <laughs> but, 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 but Catherine, so, so people did research about that. When students, uh, if they take a class, if they take a test, or they have these like honors codes, they know the rules. Actually, before they take the test online, so they are told again about all this like honors code that they're not supposed to cheat. But again, um, if this is not optimal strategy from their point of view, so it's very difficult to expect that this is going to be very, very helpful. Well, thank you both for joining us. Alexander Matros is a professor in the Darla Moore School of Business at the University of South Carolina. And Aaron Bielan is an assistant professor of data analytics at Dickinson College. I'm Katherine Barron. You've been listening to The Score. The Score is produced by the Academic Integrity and Research Group at Pando Public Relations. It is underwritten by Measure Learning and technical support is provided by This Is Distorted. To ask questions, to download show notes, or to learn more about The Score, visit our website at podcastthescore.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at at podcastthescore or find us on all the podcast platforms as The Score.